Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, wherever you are in the world. Welcome to Time to Come Alive. My name is Valerie Hope. I'm your host, I'm your coach. And this is an opportunity where we have a conversation. You can join in virtually or physically to think about what makes you more conscious, also get more connected to yourself and other people, and overall be even more creative. And every week I have a fantastic guest that gives us just the tools and the information or the inspiration to do that. And today's no exception. I'll introduce my guest in just a moment. In the meantime, I'd like for you guys to set yourselves up to really be present in this, in this conversation. First of all, if you're on social media, I recommend that you post the live stream on your wall or on your timeline so that others in your own circle can engage with you and you guys can talk about this afterwards. Uh, feel free to let them know that you're listening to Time to Come Alive so that they can access the recording later as well. Now, just prepare yourselves by, if you're sitting, to sit comfortably. Just allow whatever you're sitting on to take on the body, your weight, right? Do not put any tension or stress anywhere in your body. If you're standing, do the same. Just evenly spread your weight throughout your feet. I want you to take a couple of deep breaths and just prepare to, for this conversation. So what I'd like for you to think about today is, think about your favorite mode of expression. When I, mention, when I say expression, I'm talking about if you, perhaps there's an artistic expression that you enjoy. It could be painting, it might be writing, for some it might be teaching. Perhaps you love fixing things or cooking. And there's a lot of different ways in which one can express art. I want you to think of the one that speaks most to you and have that in your mind. Just take a couple of deep breaths as you think of it. Now I want you to reconnect with why you found that particular expression so helpful or so fulfilling. Think about when you began perhaps how you felt as you engaged in that particular activity. Think about whether or not you produce a result that's for public consumption or just your personal expression. Think about why you chose one mode or the other. Why share or why keep to yourself? Now consider that this particular mode of expression, what is it communicating? What is it bringing out, in, out of you onto the page or onto the, onto the plate or into the world? And take a couple of deep breaths. You may refocus and reconnect with us here. I want to introduce my guest to you this morning. This is Elizabeth Bachman. Now, Elizabeth, you and I, I want to say we met informally. It's been probably about nine months or so ago. We worked with the yeah. same coach. And we've had the opportunity to learn some of the same lessons. <laughs> yeah. Hopefully. Oh, oh, well, learn is, let's, I'm going to say learn a loose term for me. <laughs> some things I learned, some things I just heard and maybe didn't actually incorporate. <laughs> But one mm -hmm. of the things that really struck me with, with everything that we've done in our coaching experiences, working with the similar coaches, is that you are such an avid, first of all, learner. And I could see that you really are committed to mastering something, whether that's mastery of yourself or mastery of the subject at hand. You were so engaged. You always had questions. You always wanted to find out how and what you could do to contribute or to move things down the, the move it down the road that it was, we were placed on. And, and so I'm really curious. I'm so glad that we have a chance to talk to you this morning because I'm really curious about how that shows up in your life and why. And I was especially uh, impressed when you said that a lot of what you, who you are today was born out of a love and interest in opera. And yeah. you're one of the first people on this program that I've talked about music. So I'm excited to hear how that is a form of expression and how you've made it your own. So welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Well, you know, the thing about music is it just, it enhances emotions. You think about movies, you know, that 
you know, when the music gets all exciting and, you know, you've got the scary music or um, you think about Jaws, remember old Jaws and that bump, 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 mm -hmm. um, or the end of Gone with the Wind and you know, yeah, da, 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 how the music enhances that. Well, I grew up surrounded by music. My parents were not musicians themselves. And my dad sang a little bit, but they loved to listen to it and they loved to listen to opera. So I grew up listening to opera and uh, uh, my parents played it all the time. I was gonna be an actor. That was, it. you know, I, when I was five years old, I had the, my first went out on stage and my mom said I was the best goddamn bunny rabbit who ever <laughs> graced the stage of the hillside school. And I was totally hooked, you know, like applause. It's the most addictive drug ever. And my parents, because they loved the arts, helped me. They said, okay, go ahead, go study. And I don't know if they ever expected me to do it for a living, but I went off to college thinking I was going to be an actor and then realized I was better as a director than I was an actor. <clears throat> and oh. and what this was the distinction? I couldn't ever lose myself in a character because I always had this little sort of voice in the back of my head saying, you know, it would be better if she went over that way. And I'm the oldest child. I'm an oldest child and so <laughs> When I told my little sisters that I was changing my major from acting to directing, they went, well, duh, you boss everyone around anyway. You might as well just give up and get paid for it. So, okay, it's okay I'll be a director. I, you know, I, the cool thing about being a director also is you get to play all the parts in rehearsal without the pressure of having to do it in front of the public. So, you know, mm opera, I got to sing every part in whatever octave I felt like it, but I didn't actually have to go out there and produce the sound without microphones that would fill the theater. Uh, also, as a young person, I had long blonde hair. I was a hippie, you know, I had the, the long blonde, uh, you know, mod squad hair. If you remember Peggy Lipton in the mod squad, that was who I wanted to be. And uh, so I looked like an ingenue, but I was actually better at being a character actor. And I always wanted to play the witch. I always wanted to be the bad guy. The bad guys have much more fun. And, you know, if you don't look like the bad guy, you don't get to be the bad guy. Mm -hmm. Whereas in rehearsal, I get to play everybody. So that was also fun. You know, so I had a touch of the control queen in me, just a little <laughs> I can identify with that. <laughs> Surprise. Although I never pursued any acting or, or anything. Well, I've played instruments and stuff, but more in the performance, not necessarily in the direction. Mm -hmm. I'm really curious, though. You mentioned this idea. When you talked about music enhancing emotions, I want to go back to that. Because one of these, I have a brother who's so gifted. He's at the end of movies. He was like, oh, my gosh, I have to get that soundtrack. I'm like, mm -hmm. there was music? I don't remember any music at all. <laughs> I mean, Jaws is different because the music almost felt like a character. <laughs> yeah, it was very much a character. Yeah, yeah. But most of the time, I don't pick up on it. It just becomes a backdrop. But I think what you said really resonated with me because it does give, it, it fills out the experience, right? The experience. So I'm curious about what was it about opera as a form of music that spoke to you about above all else? Well, you know, <clears throat> I learned about it early. I grew up listening to it and, you know, I've never forgotten one year um, I would have still been in high school. Uh, after I went through the obligatory, oh, that's old people music, I then rediscovered it on my own. Um, and I was a total Verdi snob. I wanted, you know, Giuseppe Verdi, that was it. He was, you know, had to do this great soaring thing. And that's partly because my mother loved Verdi. And, uh, and so I used to listen, and there was a group of us in college that would get together and listen to opera, and you know, it was all fun, and we listened, the Saturday broadcasts from the Met were always the big thing. And then I moved to New York, not really knowing what I was gonna do, but I, 
I got caught by New York City. I said, okay, I have to be, I have to be a New Yorker now. And I would stand in front of Lincoln Center and, and look over at the Met and say, I'm going to work there someday. And then I forgot about it. Then I went off and did things. But when I, when, when I sort of fell bath backwards into a job with a small touring opera company where I was 50% of the staff and I drove the truck and, um, and swept the stage and you know, I was sort of the everybody. And we would rehearse in a small concrete room. And the sound would just fill my world. It was, oh, okay, this is what I'm going to do. Uh, and, you know, I had some sort of backing and forthing and, um, and even had an experience where I listened to somebody singing up close in rehearsal and it was the most beautiful thing I'd ever heard and I thought ah okay this is it this is what I'm going to do and the thing you don't see from the outside is of course there are lots and lots of places where you can start so I worked my way up through the ranks until I did indeed work at the Metropolitan Opera and I was a guest staff director for 12 years on and off for 12 years and I loved it. And that's where I directed, I worked with Luciano Pavarotti and Placido Domingo and all those cool people. And, and it in five languages because I'm also a bit of a language geek. So I like languages and it just really fit. It was music, theater, languages, and travel. And it took me around the world. And that was really, it was really amazing. That's fascinating because I do think that when you're talking about all these, the, this, <laughs> when you got over it being old people music, <laughs> which I yeah. think is funny. My mother loves opera, but she loves it because her mother loved opera and I don't love opera. <laughs> but I get, I get the appreciation for it. And, and, I, and I like the, the fact that you also had an opportunity to, the, it sounds like for you, the experience of the music was what made yeah. the biggest difference, right? And you mentioned that mm -hmm. concrete room and just being able to feel whatever you felt in the moment of hearing that or hearing people up close. Uh, one, I wanna go back to something that you said earlier too around performing versus directing. Because I imagine that because art in, their, in its varied expressions mm -hmm. calls forth a bit of performance, right? Is usually yeah. something that people consume or something that people produce for consumption. So I'm curious about how does one, and in your case, how did you, because I'm sure there are people listening that are experiencing there's some type of art that they want to put out in the world, or perhaps they're really keen on consuming. So how do you, when you decided that your job was best served, or your, your, your mission was best served behind the scenes and in front of the scenes, how did you go about making that decision when there seems to be so much pressure in the performance of art? Well, uh, it started because uh, I did a summer, a summer program at, at the Royal Academy of Dramatic Art in London. And I spent a month there. And there were several, a whole bunch of people doing the summer study thing. And I was in the group that didn't gel. We all hated each other. And I hated the director. And I thought, I'm, you know, and, you know, I look back now as, as a director and producer and teacher myself, and I thought he really was, he was totally phoning it in. So it, it wasn't that I was crazy, but I just hated it. And I thought, you know, I don't have to do this. Hmm. And the thing about being a performer is it's a really hard life. It's a really hard life. You should only do it if it's the only thing that matters. Because, what does that mean? Well, if it's the only thing that turns you on, that breaks you come alive, if you will, mm. if you really have to be out there and act. And, you know, it's fewer than 5% of people who get advanced degrees, masters or PhDs in the arts, any of the arts, whether it's basket weaving or painting or anything like that, fewer than 5% wind up making a living at it. And then when you do, if you can make a living, I was very lucky to be one of the ones that could, 
you only get about 10 years before your yesterday's news. You might be just as good as you ever were or better. You know more, but it's like being an actress in Hollywood. You know, where's Meg Ryan these days? She's not, nobody's, you know, she had, she had a great career and then it went away because they wanted somebody new. Somebody new came along who's younger, cuter, cheaper, you know, and it's a business. It really is a business. Mm. So I found as a director, I could be much more versatile because there were all sorts of things I could do because I didn't have to play the ingenue and sing the high notes. You know, yeah. I, I could do all sorts of things as a director rather than being in one category as an actor. And what kind of things, like how did you find that, that, that artistic love of yours expressed through your direction? Um, well, I, I worked my way up backstage and I just watched a lot of directors and I did a lot of assisting. So I started as a stage manager and then I went as an assistant director and I learned from working with the greats and, and studying and assisting really good, brilliant people. And, um, and I finally got up the nerve to throw my hat in the ring and to say, I can do this too. And I just, I learned from the masters, from following people. What kind of things did you, did you learn? You know, you, you mentioned some really notable people, right? Luciano Pavarotti, yeah, Placido yeah. Domingo. Like, what kind of things did you pick up, either from them or from others? I often think of it as the difference between craft and art. And um, I work internationally, and you still say, you know, art is a great big thing. But in order to transmit it to an audience, you need the craft of shaping it. How do you shape it in a way that people can get it? How can you use your face, use your voice, use your body, use all this technique? There's vocal technique, how you produce your voice. Uh, and there's also sort of the strategy of how do you pay attention to who's listening and then put it together in a way that they can really get it. So that when the part as a director that I really loved, I discovered that I didn't have to be out on stage for the applause. I could be, I could create a setting for someone to go out there and be amazing. And one of the things I just loved, the best part of my life really, was to be, to watch someone I had trained walk out on stage and they didn't have to think about what to do with their hands and they didn't think, have to think about where to go, whatever, because we'd done all that. And that was then in the muscle memory. And they could just open themselves up to inspiration from something greater and be a channel for Mozart. Let mm -hmm. Mozart sing through them and that that's teaching someone the craft so then they can become a channel for art yeah. and when i started training speakers i had to really think about am i willing to was i maybe going to lose that when i wasn't working with singers anymore but i found that with speakers everybody gets inspiration from somewhere else so if you open yourself up to inspiration, um, sometimes I think about it as, you know, if you're going to give, if you've got inspiration, if you've got a message for the world and you give, you give it directly to the audience, it's like hitting them with a fire hose. You know, if you get for direct example? inspiration. Well, you know, like saying all the things you know about something. You know, Valerie, if you were to say all the things you know about how people work and how groups work and, and how to come alive and how to find balance in your life, people would just be uh, drowned with it. So the craft comes in shaping that message and transmitting that, staying connected to the part that inspires you, that makes you come alive. Mm -hmm. And yet shaping it in a way that your listeners can take it in. Mm. And it's different for every audience. 
I get that. I think that, and I can imagine that it happens in every aspect of our life. Because there's usually some knowing, nudging, something that shows up that we might name inspiration that helps mm -hmm. us, that produces some sort of sensation or emotion that then hopefully sometimes takes us to action. But what I'm hearing you say is that having the inspiration is one thing because that's what gives us the impetus, right? That little, yeah. the, 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 the propulsion to, to do something and focusing on the mode of transportation for that particular impetus. Exactly. Really crafting, making sure that that mode of transportation will carry that further and then also in a way that people can engage with it. That's, that's yeah, what I hear. Both. I mean, have you ever seen um, a performer or a speaker sort of phone it in? They're up there and they're absolutely on automatic. Yeah. And they're not really paying attention to who's there. Mm -hmm. That's the technique, that's the craft without the art in it. Mm. And if you're saying the same thing over and over, if you're talking about the same thing over and over again, you've got to find ways to keep yourself connected to what inspired you in the first place. How do you do that? Because I'm, I'm even finding that, you know, I do this show every Tuesday for the most part now, close to a year. And, and yeah, there are some things that are pretty standard, but I know that there's an effort that's need, that needs to be made because every person I speak to is different. Every topic that we touch is different. But there's an effort on my part to really stay engaged to like, okay, why am I talking to this person? What is it about this yeah. person that needs to be put out there? Um, but it's usually pretty subconscious. So I'd love for you to bring it out to the conscious. Like, what is it that helps people stay connected to the inspiration in the transmission of the art? Well, part of that is for, for performers, it's finding the moment that makes, that touches you and reminding yourself where that's going to touch you. For speakers, find the place where you can talk about what gets you excited mm -hmm. and, and reconnect to that feeling. Uh, they call it sense memory in acting school. You know, find that memory of that sensation of how it felt. I often start a speech with a, a story about Luciano Pavarotti. And I do, one of the reasons why I do that is I talk about how excited it is. You know, I got to stand on the side and watch him walk out in front of a packed house and nail it. He was great. He was wonderful. And as I'm saying that, I'm connecting to how that felt. And, and I say, this is why I do what I do. And I get myself all excited as I do that. And then I go back and I say, that client was Luciano Pavarotti singing the role of Radames in Aida at the Metropolitan Opera. And I have done that so that I make myself connect. And then the punchline is, I tell, you tell the client, but there was this client and he had this problem, et cetera, et cetera. And then when I give the punchline of who it was, that's deliberately coming down from how excited I was. Mm. But I let myself feel it every time. I feel about, you know, the expression on his face. He was, at, he was having a really bad time and I helped him out with a really, at a really tough moment. And he went out and he nailed it. And he'd been in the middle of talking himself out of being able to do it. So I could connect to that and knowing that I had a part of it, part in it, and saying, yeah, this is what I do. Mm. Cool. That's, you know, that's what keeps me going. That's interesting because what I'm hearing is you also, you set yourself up. Like it's not something that just happens haphazardly or by accident, but you really set yourself up at the outset to go, okay, this is why. And communicating that at the same time for two purposes, I imagine it really draws in the audience the way you recount it, but then also mm -hmm. reconnects you with that part of you that made you decide to say yes to this particular role or this particular experience. Um, mm -hmm. So I think that's really, that's, that's really smart because, yeah, I can see how, you know, the, in, in strategic uh, speaking, people talk a lot about start with a story, you know, really 
of the technique of drawing people in, keeping them on the edge of their seat. There's all these different things that one can do. Mm -hmm. But what I'm hearing you say that it's not just for the audience. Like this is literally for oh, yeah. us, for us yeah. to connect with who we are, who we're being and what we want to accomplish in that moment. That's, that's really yeah. brilliant. Um, are you at liberty to share what you worked on with Pavarotti? Or is that confidential? Uh, um, well, it, you know, the details, what makes it, but what happened was uh, he was really nervous and he, he was worried. It was near the end of his career and he was worried that he wasn't going to be able to do it. He wasn't going to be able to pull it off. Mm. And I said, would you like to practice this? Would you like to go? And he said, no, 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 no. I'm, I'm too busy. I've got too much else to do. And yeah, you know, I'll just wing it. So I'm, I'm a pro. I can manage it. And I thought, okay. Uh, and then he waited and he worried and he, he, you know, he waited. And then the night before the opening, he called me up at three o'clock in the morning because he couldn't. So um, he, and we met the next day. And since the performance was that night, I just gave him three different things to do. And most of them were about um, moments to distract him. Where I knew he was, work, he was nervous. I gave him something else to do to distract him. Mm -hmm. And then there was a physical gesture he was do, doing. And I gave him, again, something else to do because it was actually um, sabotaging him, the physical gesture. Um, it, it had to do with, he was so worried about having a dry mouth that it was about getting a sucrets, getting a, a lozenge in his mouth. And uh, it could be like this. <laughs> and I figured out a way to work around that. So he could get the could get the juice in his mouth when he needed it, but he didn't stand there. <laughs> that was and it's a much longer that's that a much longer story. Sabotage. An opera singer to have a lozenge lodged in the corner of their mouth. Opera oh. singers use lozenges all the time. During and, the performance? Oh yeah. Constantly. Really? Because you're not always singing, you know. Yeah. You're the one who's singing. You spend a lot of time, most people, most almost every role, you spend a whole lot of time, more time listening than you do singing. Mm. So it's not just about what you're saying, it's what yeah. they're saying to you and about you. Mm. And when they're listening, that's the time that they can just put a little recola in your <laughs> so here's a couple of things that just that came up for me just now like there's there's clearly a way that you listen to speaker or performer that has you then direct them to you know take on you know to perform a, you know, a different technique or to do things in a certain way to enhance their mm -hmm. performance so what is it that you are listening for what and what gives you the what's the the tip off that oh this is it. This is the thing that we need to work on. These are the three things that he needs to do. To be honest, I probably can't tell you unless it's in a specific, it's, it's, re, I, I've been doing this for, for 30 years. So over 30 years. So, um, it, you know, it's pretty automatic by now. It, just pulling from a toolbox of experience of sometimes I'll remember how somebody did such and so, or, oh, you know, there was this thing that we did in Zurich, you know, or there was this thing that we did in Paris. And I watched, um, I, I worked with a director called Jean-Pierre Ponel, who was a legend in the 70s and 80s. And um, I assisted him on a show in Paris and Venice. And he was, ha we were having terrible technical trouble. And he said, you know, there was this thing that I saw when I was an apprentice at da 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 Maybe we could try an old mechanical way instead of the fashion, the, instead of the computer thing that's not working. And I thought, oh, he does that too. That was something he saw as a junior apprentice that he pulled out of some recess of his brain. And then I thought, oh, well, that's okay. I can do that. If I saw somebody do, you kind of, you know, tell you know things without knowing them. Yeah. So um, to be honest, in terms of listening and there are, way, there are things you can break down, but most of the time it's just having been at it for so long. Mm -hmm. 
the great thing about performance technique is we have we have three thousand years of theater history to pull from. So mm. you know, there's also it's all been done before. There's pretty you know most of the time it's never been. You're not doing it for the first time. So how can you make it better? You know, and the Greeks were working on how do you how do you do a play that people will respond to? Mm. What, Elizabeth, one thing I'm, I'm curious about when you think about how to how how to support someone, right? There's first of all, there's so many shows on television nowadays that are, I mean, not only shows like the performing shows, like you have America's Got Talent, you have The Voice, you have like all these, the you know, American Idol, you have all those types of shows, but then you also have this plethora of people who are doing speaking. So there's Gold Cast and there's TED Talks. I mean, there's everything. And everyone is doing something at a fairly high level, it seems, or at least, I mean, you know, the exposure they get is, is, is fairly high level. So I'm curious about when you start to notice those programs, whether they're musical performances or speaking performances, what do you, what, what draws you into a particular performance or what seems to make you kind of go, oh, I could work with this person or, oh, this person needs this or that? Is there something going on behind their eyes? That's the main thing. You know, what are they thinking about? What are they communicating from the heart? And, you know, if it, and, and, you know, you don't get to the auditions on America's Got Talent or The Voice without having gone through a whole series of junior assistants in a little rehearsal room. Uh, so any of those things, you know, you have those long, long lines of people, but you only see maybe 20 or 30 mm -hmm. on, on the TV show. That's because six months before that, the various assistants have sat there and listened to hundreds and hundreds of arias. And I've done that. I've listened to 250 people in three days, you know, that kind of thing. Um, and there's a spark. Is there a spark? Is there something in the eye that makes you go, ooh, that's interesting, especially if you've listened to a lot of them. So you're looking at their eye and listening to what exactly? Is, again, you can't really define it. And it's very subjective. Is there mm. something that makes you go, oh, they're really being that character. Mm. They're really, they have something important to say. Or are they, um, or are they just phoning it in? You know, oh. That's that's a you know, if you've got someone who's said something a million times, I've certainly seen speakers who've been out there speaking for a long time, and they come in and they just do it on, on totally automatic because there's no real thought behind it. They're not thinking about who are they talking to. They're not talking to me. They're not communicating with me. So if I'm judging, then I want to say, are you, are you really being that character? What is, why is Carmen saying this? If you're going to sing something from Carmen, you've got to know why and who she is and what, what is it that makes her want to say this? Instead, and, or are you just singing the notes? Mm. And it's, the, it's that indefinable thing of channeling the art, of opening yourself to Mozart or Bizet for Carmen or uh, something like that. Or if you're up there speaking, are you thinking about, oh my God, I have to get them to buy my product or I'm going to miss my mortgage payment? Or are you thinking, I have information that can really help you here's a taste of it oh. and uh, if you if you work with me you're investing in yourself through me but I am a means to an end working with me is a way of honing you and it's really it's like are they just in their own head or are they truly communicating and thinking about where is the sound going where is the speech going where is the idea going and who's listening and what are you, and then when you're doing that, you get, 
energy back from the audience, which is even better. So, you know, when you're really giving your energy out and you receive it back from the audience that's going, yes, 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 tell me more. Mm. That's what we're looking for. It's that energy loop. This is, this is really brilliant because I think what you're describing is, and well, obviously when you're on a stage and there's many <laughs> and then there's one, that is a lot more evident. But what I can hear you also speaking to is in life in general, is how well we are engaged with the person or the situation that's in front of us at that moment. How present are we? How, yeah. how are we just going through the motions and doing whatever looks good to do? Whatever would avoid us looking bad is like really taking on being present with the, mm -hmm. the situation, with the person, communicating something that's actually happening at the moment. And I can see that that would have a huge impact on and how that energy is transmitted because it is energy is not just like this the person the loop of energy doesn't stay within the person exactly. it goes out to someone and then that person receives it and their energy goes out so it's it's reciprocated that's that it's all about yeah it's all about service mm. I mean, if you think about a job interview if you go into a job interview thinking, oh my God, I'm asking them to spend money on me and I need this spot, okay, you're in your own head, you're stuck here. But if you go into a job interview to say, they need somebody with my skills, I'm bringing them a gift. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And what are they looking for that I can give them? Yeah. It, you know, I myself am the gift, my skill is the gift, then it's a whole different ball game. Mm -hmm. And people will sense that. Yeah. I think, yeah, you're, you're about how to be of service to someone or to something and, and being very clear that it's not, that we ourselves person is not necessarily the service but what we have to transmit, what we have to communicate, what we have to offer, that there's something that comes through us. And what I hear mm -hmm. you saying is to allow, first of all, to connect to what it is that needs to come through so that we're aware of it. Then we get out of the way, <laughs> get the ego out of the way. So it's not like we're stuck in our heads about it, but we allow whatever that inspiration is to come through and connect in a meaningful way with the person that's in front of us. Yeah. That's yeah. Well, it's well, all about service you know what can you do yeah. and the the cool thing about being a speaker or a performer if you think about basic human needs mm -hmm. i figured this out a long time ago is that one of the human needs is significance so as a performer i need to feel like i'm significant but the ones that are doing it only for themselves is like then then you get the, the narcissist the narcissist, they need to be significant and it's all about them. But you can fulfill this need for significance by serving other people and, you know, making them grateful for how you've helped them. Yeah. That's, uh, you know, there are plenty of people who feel the need for significance and never want to get up, I mean, who who help other people and never want to get up in front of a group. So that's kind of the, um, the difference between the people who enjoy speaking, even though they're introverts, I'm an introvert, lots of introverts get out there as speakers. Mm -hmm. And you can serve people best by teaching them something. Mm. A way that they feel like they've gotten something important and so that is service and it helps the little that basic human need of significance yeah feeling you matter feeling that what we're yeah. important yeah also I like, need I, to matter all of us yeah. all of us do you're right i think and i've learned that from young people actually i don't know if i was as aware of it when i was young but as i mentor young youth one of the things that i notice is that Many of them have, you know, a few questions, like, like in the right in the background of their mind as they're interacting with the world. And one of them I've realized is not only who am I, right? understanding themselves, who they are, how they behave, why things matter to them, but the do I matter is the second question 
that I think yeah. comes up for them. Are the, you know, and I think it was uh, Toni Morrison who told Oprah Winfrey once, I saw this in an interview, that does, um, the question is, do your eyes light up when that child enters a room? Like, so if you're, if you're standing in front of a group of people and you're communicating something, are your eyes lit up? Kind of a step, you know, back yeah. to what you said, what's behind the eyes that shows yeah. that you are not only, are you feeling that you matter, but actually are you engaging with people as if they matter? As if yeah. they matter. So, oh yeah. yes, yeah, that, that's, a, that's an important way of getting the significance. I think because the, what you, know, what you described about the significance is really in a, a, a form and expression of wanting to be loved. Mm -hmm. It's really yeah. an expression of wanting to be loved is, is I want to feel like you know, somebody cares about what I think, do, say, feel, how mm -hmm. I behave. And, and we can often be lulled into thinking that comes from us. <laughs> that just I have to create that for myself and that may be what turns into what we define as narcissism and I also can see that that narcissism is a form of asking for love just not knowing how to you know mm -hmm. maybe a, a form of defense so, but anyway but we digress <laughs> yes right 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 <laughs> you guys get really deep uh, so um, tell me a little bit about one of uh, first of all I know you're from Oregon originally and that's where you mm -hmm. live half the time but now you're in this other beautiful country tell us about this country you're in and what you do there I'm in Austria so uh, my wife is German and her family has a vacation home in the Alps mm -hmm. so we're between Innsbruck and Munich and uh, and I grew up going hiking in the in the fir forests of Oregon so that was what I was thought this is the definition of beauty for me and I'm, I'm a mountain mountain love the mountains love looking at the mountains and so when I came here I said oh it looks it's perfect it's a it looks very beautiful and then when it was time for me to start a company of my own I um, I had invitations in France and in Italy, but I wanted to do it here in the beautiful, the state of Tyrol. So this is where you see lederhosen and dirndls and they play um papa music and so forth. And, and there's lots of other things around that. But when I started an opera, an international opera school and performance venue, I did it here also because international study had always been a fascination of mine. So I wanted to do it in a place where we had German speaking singers from Austrians and Germans and Americans and others from other English speaking places around the world where you could live and work together, learn to get better artists, but also on the side, uh, learn how to deal with someone who uh, who looks just like you and has very different assumptions about how the world works. Mm, very subtle, underhand. So, uh, you know, one of the joys of of working in international opera houses, working around the world, was that you get people from all over who come together for a specific purpose. And uh, one of the joys of of studying languages is that then you get together on the first day and you say, are we going to speak English, Italian, or German? Those are like the three <laughs> languages. Those or are the Russians, three that you speak? I, uh, and Spanish and French. Those are, the, those are the languages that you speak? English, French, German, Italian, Spanish. Oh, muy bien. Hablas español. Hablo español. <laughs> I, I can't write Spanish. I never studied it quite long enough, but I, uh, I was the artistic advisor for a company in Puerto Rico for five years. So I did, did a lot of Spanish there. That's so cool. I love yeah. that you're in Austria. That's actually one of the most beautiful countries I've had a chance to visit. I went to Salzburg years and years ago in Wels, and mm -hmm. I can't remember, maybe there's another city that I went to, but it's absolutely gorgeous. I did go on the Sound of Music tour while I was there. So that was that was an important part of my, <laughs> yeah, my experience. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. You know, I watched the Sound of Music, and I I memorized the Sound of Music, and um, I was going to be Julie Andrews when I grew up. Oh, <laughs> I've been amazed all those years of teaching how many people were inspired to learn singing through that that movie. Why do you think that is? 
because it's glorious music and it's it's about the power of music i think mm. i think it just was it was all the it was the right combination mm. yeah i this is clearly not about the sound of music but i i will, i will admit that i i've loved it since day one and i i don't know if i saw it in the movie theater or where i saw it first but i i remember just being hooked i think the melodies the storyline mm -hmm. There's so much that that sank in. Now I will say I don't notice soundtracks on movies that are not about music, but I do notice them when the music is the movie, right? And and, yeah. I, and I actually do enjoy musicals quite a bit. And it was one of those that yeah, it, it, there's so many songs within that musical that really, yeah, just touched me. So yeah. this yeah. Anyway, but I did go on a tour and it was fun. And I do remember there's another song that around the time I was in in Austria it was pretty popular. Anton aus Tirol. <laughs> Do you know that song? Ah, okay. <laughs> not off the top. I've heard it, but not off the top of my head. It's a little techno song. It probably won't work in your repertoire. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but yeah. since you say you're in Tirol, I'm like, ah, oh, Tirol, yes. <laughs> yeah, so we're in the state of Tirol. And, <laughs> and then my, so my program was called the Tyrolean Opera Program, or the Tirol Open Program. Works in both languages. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, is top and then you know we're top opera so we were top opera ran for 11 years several of our our alumni are singing on world stages and mm. we changed lives and by the end of it i was done i'd been doing it for 30 years and i was getting kind of burned out and mm. that was also the time when i was helping speakers i started helping speakers to sort of pay for my opera habit and I realized that I could learn all about soil microbes or technical things or help someone explain why a computer system is like a Swiss army knife. Every client I have is different and unusual. And that's really interesting. I, I've spent a good chunk of this morning helping, uh, helping someone who's runs a nonprofit to empower girls. And help her explain what she does that makes it really, it makes it make sense and will hopefully move her audience to donate. And mm. so that's, that I feel like I'm doing something really important and important in the world by helping someone being sort of an outside eye and ear for someone who has an important message but was getting kind of lost in the weeds. Got it. When okay, so 30 years in in the world of opera and teaching and running your school, when did you notice that you were just kind of burning out like you said, when it was time to pivot to something else? What what was happening? Oh. I just, you know, it's when you're working with young voices, it's the same 20 arias over and over again. And so I was kind of on automatic pilot. Mm -hmm. It's the same arias over and over again. And you've done it once, you've done it a million times. And I was, I was working on automatic. I wasn't excited anymore. I would be excited about the people and watching them develop. That was exciting. But um, also, and I'm sorry if there are any singers out there or performers out there who hear this, after you've watched a lot of people with a lot of promise come out, but fewer than 5% ever wind up doing it for a living, yeah. you also know that you're teaching, you're teaching skills that will be useful for the rest of their lives, but they probably won't ever get paid for it. Yeah. And and then the repertoire was wonderful, but uh, but after a while, you just do it over and over and over again, and you've done it a million times. And you know, how do you make it different? How do you make it new? And and in the, in the meantime, I was working with business presenters, and that was just more interesting. Hmm. Yeah, I can see that after a while, the repetitive the, the repetitiveness yeah. can be kind of kind of wear on you. And because when you said earlier that it's really that inspiration that has to come through you and you when you notice that hey this isn't happening for me anymore it's probably a really good time to pivot and find something else and i, and I think that's true out of life like there's yeah. there's cycles to everything that we do and mm -hmm. if we can't connect to that part of us 
that has a start a cycle to begin with any longer, perhaps mm -hmm. there's the next cycle that we need to move into. So how, exactly. so as you, as you pivoted and you've shifted to working with, with speakers and you're getting to learn all these new, different, interesting things, what are some of the things that you've learned about yourself? I've learned, I've learned that it's way too easy for me to give away my time. So I'm trying to be more business-like <laughs> about it these days. <laughs> you know? um, and I've learned to, that I can get interested in just about anybody if they're really serious about trying to be better and try to deliver a message. Um, and so finding people that I can work with who can actually afford me and to really treat it like a business, not a hobby, that has taken me um, an embarrassingly long time because I, I was doing it for love for so long. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I have a mortgage to pay. So I have to, <laughs> you know, and it, it comes the time you have to actually figure out how are you going to do this. Yeah. And I choose to, I do still choose to make a living and pay my mortgage by doing something that excites me that I'm really good at. That's the key, right? Doing something that yeah. you love, that, that you're good at, that you know that you have an opportunity to be of service, like you said earlier. Yeah, um, but it's really easy to be of service and not serve yourself. So part of it yeah. is serving myself and serving my family by bringing enough money to pay the mortgage. Got it. I, I did have an experience when I started, when I first started my, my own business, working for myself, that the gifts that I felt that I had most readily available to give, you know, gifts of coaching or speaking, those things, I already did regularly um, when I worked for a corporation. And so there wasn't an exchange of financial, there's no money exchanging hands in order for me to give my gift. But when I shifted to my own company, all of a sudden it's like, oh, now the way I give my gift is if somebody pays for it, it's no longer a gift, now it's a product. That was, I know I, I had to shift my mindset incredibly. Yeah. What I found myself doing is, because I think that's part of, you know, when we have inspiration, I think it is our job to allow it to come through us. And that we have gifts that we should be giving. And so what I did is to find a cause. And in this case, it was mentoring young people and getting involved in Toastmasters. For example, I found ways that I could mentor, that I could coach, that I could speak and gift this gift, this gift, mm -hmm. right? I could, and I could kind of keep the flow of, abund of abundance. And then mm -hmm. it enabled me to have conversations with others who wanted to do this on a professional level. Now consider this, I can take this gift, continue to give it here, but at the same time not produce a profit. I right? now produce mm -hmm. a product and a service that will help others engage. And then yeah. there's a financial, uh, com there's a compensation involved. So it was really a, a journey though, to get from there, to understand like where that energy was coming from. So it sounds like in your case, yeah. it was similar. When you started to see that, hey, I have all this gift to give someone, all this knowledge and skill, they're not likely going to take it seriously enough to make a, make a living from it. Therefore, the compensation that they're having to offer may not be commensurate to the skill level that you're yeah. going to work with. So mm -hmm. interesting. So who do you work with? What's who, Who's your target? What? So how do you find yeah, them? I, I mostly work with uh, corporate women in male-dominated uh, male dominated industries. Mm -hmm who need to, um, who are, need to learn how to speak up and then be heard when they do. So mm -hmm. that's about half of it. So of course, if somebody wants to do a speech, I help people with speeches a lot, but also a lot of it is how do you present yourself in a meeting? How do you get people to listen to you? How are you on the conference call? And uh, you say, you want to say, hey, there's something wrong with this process and they're all excited about it. And you're the one who says, wait a minute, wait a minute. You know, has anybody ever asked the client if they want this? Uh, something like that. So um, it's a lot of speaking to get funding, speaking to get allies, or speaking to get recognition because there are always those of us who 
say, who sit in a conference and they look up at the speaker and they think, damn, I'm twice as smart as she is. Why isn't that me up there? What was the third thing you said? Funding allies and the third was? Recognition. Of oh, recognition. Far. Takes you far. Funding mm -hmm. is recognition. Got it. That's that significance. <laughs> Tie back to that yeah. significance. Yeah. And, you know, and that's basically where people come to me. Uh, they either need funding or they, they need help to uh, be visible and to, to get promoted. That's all about allies. Mm -hmm. um, and then recognition, there are the ones who look up at the speaker and think, I should be doing that. How do I get there? And mm -hmm. then, and I say, here's how you get there. I'll take you through it. So that's, that's what I do. Excellent, excellent. And how do you stay, how do you stay alive? How do you, how do you keep yourself coming back to life every time you work with a new person? What's it that, that you do now? Everybody's different. It's because it's a, it's a new message every time. It might be the same main idea, but the details are all di always different. Mm. So what is it for this person to make her, his or her message come through the best? There are often a lot of speakers that I work with, male and female, who have been speaking for a long time and now they know how, need to know how to monetize it. So that's another group that I work with them. Entrepreneurs and people who have been giving away their knowledge. Mm. How do you actually get paid for it? It's time. And, um, you know, and it's okay to get paid for what you're really good at. Mm -hmm. I, I think it's, if you've got something important to say, it's a gift and a privilege to talk about it, but it's also a responsibility. It's your responsibility to tell the world if there's something going on. Mm, absolutely. Well, Elizabeth, it's always a, a pleasure to interact with you. Like I said, I think you're, yeah. you're one of those minds that are always seeking mastery. So there's no surprise that you've taken what you've honed over many years and now are using that same gift and expressing it in a different way, which I think is what life's about. You know, we're given tools. We're not necessarily given the product. So we can use the yeah. tools in a lot of creative ways. And it sounds like you've really found some ways to use the tools in ways that are meaningful to you and helpful to other people. So. It is truly a gift and a blessing to be able to do this. Yay. Well, thank you so much for being here. I just want to acknowledge you oh, for thank that. You. For sharing so openly with, of yourself and, and telling us some of those tips and tricks of the trade, but also I think grounded in reality more than anything. Uh, well, thank you so thank much. Thank you, Valerie. It's, it's, a, it's been fun to know you, and I'm sure that we will go on and have any more great conversations, and maybe I'll interview you one of these days. Hey, <laughs> I'm yeah. to that. Okay, let's um, do it. Good. And for the rest of you, thank you so much for joining and listening in. If you want to get a hold of Elizabeth, I will put her contact information and her website on our notes. So feel free to reach out to you if you're looking for that, that expertise. Next week, we have Jaleesa Harrison joining us, and she's going to be, she's from My Money Mogul, the name of her company. And she's had some wonderful transformative experience with the issue of money, having conversations about it and different things that she's dealt with over the generations. And now she's bringing some of that to light by how she coaches, but then also how she even raises her family to focus on, on breaking the, the messages or the or transforming their beliefs around money. So really excited about that on October 8th. Come join us for that. Elizabeth, again, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, my friend. I'm delighted to be part of this. Yay! Vielen Dank! Ah, gern geschehen. Ich spreche kein Deutsch. I know okay. a few words. I'm biscuit. So very yeah. cool. Everyone, thank you so much for tuning in. Have a wonderful rest of your week. Bye. Thank you.